So this week we're going to be talking about chapter 16, which is about pricing strategy. This is a fairly short chapter, so I'm going to try to go pretty quickly through um, this lecture note outline. Um, as far as kind of like prices, um, up until now we've assumed that firms are going to charge a single price for their products, and so now we kind of ask the question, is this model kind of good enough? So in this chapter, we're going to be talking about um, when is it possible for a firm to charge different prices for the same product? Why would they want to do that? And then would such a practice increase or decrease efficiency? And then what other pricing strategies um, make sense for firms to use? So as far as... Um, Pricing strategies, we're going to start by thinking about um, supposing two identical products are sold from four different prices. So why perhaps would um, an iPad, for example, sell in Atlanta for one price, but in San Francisco for another price? Like, why would that happen? Um, and then essentially thinking about as an entrepreneur, what we would do is start buying um, iPads in the location in which they were at a lower price and then sell them in the location in which they had a higher price. So essentially what that is called, that is called arbitrage, which is the practice of buying a product in one market and reselling it in a market with a higher price. Okay, so if essentially this arbitrage can happen, what's going to happen to the prices in Atlanta, well, let's assume Atlanta, it's costing them $500. Well, San Francisco, it's only costing them $430. Essentially, what will happen is the supply of iPads in Atlanta will rise, which decreases the price in Atlanta, and the supply of iPads in San Francisco will fall, increasing the price in San Francisco. So if you were completely free to transport the iPads from San Francisco to Atlanta, essentially the price would converge to being exactly the same in each location, which is called the law of one price. And so because there are transaction costs for transporting the iPads from um, the market with the lower price to the market with the higher price, we call these transaction costs. So these are the costs in time and other resources that parties incur in the process of agreeing to and carrying out an exchange of goods or services. So keep in mind, um, it's no, it's not just um, physical monetary costs, but also costs in time as well. So we can think about um, also opportunity costs. So as far as um, transaction costs go, we're going to expect the law of one price to hold perfectly when the transaction costs are zero. Um, and so when thinking about kind of, you know, how a firm can increase its profits through price discrimination, we're kind of moving into the next segment. So what is price discrimination? Price discrimination is charging different prices to different customers for the same 
product when the price differences are not due to differences in cost. So let me space this down. And so when we think about um, price discrimination, we can use the example of going to see a movie. So as a student, um, you would probably get um, a student discount sometimes in some movie theaters. Um, your grandparents may get a senior discount, um, but most of the time, the regular average person is going to have to pay full price. So the movie theater is gonna charge these different prices even though it costs them the exact same amount to show the movie to each person involved. Think about like the child discount as well. Um, and so that's kind of an example of price discrimination. So um, generally discrimination on the basis of arbitrary characteristics such as like race or gender are generally illegal under the civil rights laws. Um, however, price discrimination when it's performed on the basis of willingness and ability to pay is generally legal. So that's the idea of, um, you know, students and children and the elderly tend to not have as much income um, compared to a working adults. And so their willingness to pay for a movie ticket tends to be lower. So Essentially, when we're talking about price discrimination, we're going to identify um, kind of three characteristics in a situation in which price discrimination is possible. So our three characteristics um, would be when firms possess market power, when there's identifiable groups of consumers that have different willingness to pay for the product, and then when arbitrage of the product is not possible. So we're gonna just space this out a little bit so we can write some stuff about each one of them. So I just wanna make a note quickly. Generally, But going back to our three characteristics, when firms possess market power. So if we think about um, market power, we kind of talk, talked about that in the monopoly chapter. But when we think about when firms possess market power, if they don't possess any market power, the firm um, is otherwise a price taker. So think about perfect competition. Um, identifiable groups of consumers that have d different willingness to pay for the product. Um, if you can't identify who's willing to pay what, you're not going to be able to charge different prices. And then finally, um, arbitrage of the product is not possible. So um, either because reselling the product is uh, not logically possible, um, example would be like education, you can't um, resell your degree once you, once you have it, um, or because the transaction costs involved make it impractical.
Okay, so kind of moving um, to the next idea, which is the idea of groups with consumers um, with different willingness to pay. This kind of falls under the second um, category characteristic of identifiable um, groups. And so if a firm can practice price discrimination, who are they going to charge um, a higher price to? So we can identify two kind of types of groups um, that are going to see um, uh, higher prices. So groups with um, groups with higher demand and then also groups with lower price elasticity of demand. So we think about groups with higher demand overall. These are people who are willing to pay more and the firms will profit by charging them more. When we think about groups with a lower price elasticity of demand, these are people who are going to be less sensitive to prices. So if you increase the price um, on them, it's going to result in fewer of them ceasing to buy the product. So we want to think about um, going back to chapter six, I think was about elasticity. We want to think about you're going to be less price sensitive, so you're going to charge people who are less price sensitive a higher price. So quickly now, we just want to define the idea of yield management. So yield management is actually the practice of continually adjusting prices um, to account for changes in demand to maximize profit. So we're going to, it's the practice of continually adjusting prices to account for changes in demand to maximize profit. So a really great example of this would be um, the airline industry. So they're going to adjust prices of flights depending on you know how full the flight is, um, what they anticipate demand for the flights going to be before de departure. So yield management is a very sophisticated form of price discrimination. It's going to rely on gathering and understanding a lot of data about um, your customers and your behavior. So we think about two. Um, you know, when you buy your ticket kind of changes, changes the price that you're going to pay, um, you know, how much luggage you're going to take. There's a lot of, um, you know, factors that the airline industry is going to have to take into consideration when pricing tickets. And so um, kind of expanding a little bit more on airlines, um, Think about, you know, your, they divide their customers into two categories, business travelers and leisure travelers. So essentially, think about business travelers are going to be um, less price sensitive. They're going to have a lower price elasticity of demand because they have to um, travel for uh, meetings, conferences, etc. And so profit maximization is going to suggest charging them more. But no one's going to... Um, necessarily actively volunteer to provide the information that they're a business traveler if um, it means they're going to have to pay more. So essentially airlines again are going to infer this information from kind of how far in advance you're like booking your flight and then how long you're planning on staying. So you see those flights that are leaving out um, on a like um, 
on a Friday and coming back on a Sunday are going to be a little bit more expensive. So, um, the next thing I want to talk about is the idea of perfect price discrimination or first degree price discrimination. So what that is, so perfect or first degree price discrimination, that's charging consumers a price exactly equal to their willingness to pay for the product, good or service, etc. So in this case, every consumer would buy the product, but consumer surplus would be zero. The firm would extract all surplus from the market. Um, kind of in practice, perfect price discrimination is impossible, but it can kind of illustrate a surprising result that price discrimination might actually increase economic efficiency. So every time you kind of hear the words price discrimination, you might think, oh, that's, that's a bad thing, but um, it, it may kind of, this example may illustrate that it might actually increase efficiency, which is a good thing. So we want to make the note that consumer surplus equals zero. So now I'm going to draw two different graphs, one with a monopoly um, that does not um, conduct perfect price discrimination and then another in which they're able to um, perfectly price discriminate. So we have our one right here. So this is going to be um, monopolist that cannot price discriminate. And then this graph is going to be perfect price discrimination. So in this case, we're actually going to set our marginal cost equal to our average cost. So we still have a downward sloping demand curve. And then we have a marginal revenue curve that's going to be below our demand curve. But for our marginal cost and average cost, we're actually going to set it so they are equal. So our MC equals average cost. Okay, so as usual, in um, when we're looking at a graph, the monopolist is going to choose the quantity where MR equals MC, right? So where MR equals MC, that is right here. So we have our Q monopoly. Remember where MC is equal to demand, this would be our efficient output. However, remember when we are, we've identified our profit maximizing quantity, but in order to identify our profit maximizing price, we need to go all the way up to the demand curve and then over to our Y axis. So remember we had price over here, I didn't label our accesses, and we had quantity, and then we had price, and we had quantity. So remember, if we're going to identify our areas of surplus on this um, 
graph, we're going to have consumer surplus that again is everywhere. This is this is price for a monopoly. Consumer surplus is everywhere above the price but below what? The demand curve. So everywhere above the price but below the demand curve is going to be our consumer surplus. However, remember, because many consumers are actually willing to make, pay more than marginal cost, um, they actually miss out. And so this results in, remember, dead weight loss. So we have, remember, dead weight loss, because we're producing at this quantity, a lower quantity than efficient output. So we're going to have dead weight loss is this triangle in pink. So I'm just going to dead weight loss. And then we see our, our profit again is everything going to be above our average cost, remember, up to our, our price that we're charging. So we have our profit here in green. So we have our monopolist that cannot price discriminate and we're looking at a MC that's equal to our average cost. However, now let's look at what happens if we allow the monopolist to perfectly price discriminate. So we're going to go ahead and pull that average cost, marginal cost curve over again. MC equals average cost. And then we're also, um, in this case, our demand curve is going to equal our marginal revenue curve. So demand equals marginal revenue. And so we see here, where would the uh, monopoly output and efficient output be located? They would actually be located in the same place. So this is Q monopoly and efficient output. Therefore, the monopolist is going to sell to every customer uh, with a willingness to pay greater than the marginal cost, which is going to maximize profit. So then they're going to sell at also efficient quantity. So we're going to see an entire triangle of profit rather than rather than our small square that we saw before. So what we can see is that with price discrimination, we're going to see an increase in profit for firms. I mean, that makes sense. They wouldn't do it otherwise. Um, and so we're gonna just make a note, price discrimination. increases profits but it decreases consumer surplus So overall, we can say that price discrimination, it eliminates dead weight loss, it increases economic efficiency, 
But unfortunately, that economic efficiency that we would actually be increasing, it's not always um, like ambiguous to the overall welfare within the economy. So the result of price the results of price discrimination on overall welfare are ambiguous. Okay, so the last thing we're going to talk about um, are kind of other pricing strategies. So um, odd, we have odd pricing, cost plus pricing, and then a two-part tariff. And I'm just going to make some more room for me to write quickly. And so... What these are essentially other pricing strategies that firms um, can use. So what pr odd price pricing is, um, odd pricing would be charging, let's say four ninety five instead of five dollars. So you see a lot of prices that are like, you know, um. 99 cents instead of being rounded to a whole dollar and kind of why would a firm kind of do that? So actually the strongest reason for the use of odd pricing is essentially the apparent psychological effect on consumers and so um, in my behavioral economics class I kind of we kind of talked about this and studied um, essentially uh, we might could be potentially seeing irrational behavior because although you're um, you're only paying in this case five cents more you feel like you're you're saving money if you see a price of 495 so rationally you'd be like there's not that much of a difference between 495 and five dollars but um essentially you may actually view that psychologically as much less than it is in reality Okay, the next one um, that we're going to talk about, actually, I do have one more thing I want to say about odd pricing as far as um, whether or not this actually occurs. So there has been quite a bit of research done that's tested odd pricing by estimating demand curves for items statistically and then kind of surveying people to find out um, how much they would buy if the price was um, $4.99 versus $5. And so this price difference should actually result in a very small increase in quantity demanded, but the actual increase in quantity demanded was generally way larger than expected. So that kind of goes back to, um, you know, consumers behaving irrationally. So the next one is cost plus pricing. So what cost plus pricing is, this is um, pricing equal to some fixed percentage above average total cost. And so essentially cost plus pricing um, it kind of comes close to achieving profit maximization in two different situations. Um, one being when our marginal cost and average cost are about equal. And then the second being when a firm has a difficult time
estimating its demand curve. So in theory, cost plus pricing is incorrect because profit maximization, again, um, it requires pricing where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. But we have these two cases in which it kind of comes close to achieving profit maximization. Um, kind of in, in the latter of these two cases, cost plus pricing can be useful because um, if the firm can identify which products are likely to have more or less price elastic demand, they're able to adjust the markup accordingly. So kind of an example of cost plus pricing in an industry in which you would see it in would be the publishing industry. So it's very sometimes difficult to assign costs like the labor costs and stuff like that to specific books. And so um, there, a very common approach would be to multiply the physical cost of production by seven or eight to arrive at the final cost of the book itself. And then the last pricing strategy I want to talk about is the use of a two-part tariff. So what a two-part tariff is, it's um, when consumers pay one price for the right to buy as much of a related good as they want at a second price. So kind of memberships such as Sam's Club or potentially like a local country club, they work like this. So we have Sam's Club country clubs um also phone companies uh they might um you know charge um a monthly charge plus a certain fee for the additional additional data or additional um you know minutes stuff like that um we can think about like with um, a country club, you may you may pay your membership fee, but then you still have to pay every time that you go out on the golf course. Um, and then, for example, like why would a um, company use such a pricing strategy? And so we can also think about um, the idea of uh, a Disney World. Essentially, they're um, able to identify customers' willingness to pay for the tickets, and then. Um, so they're, they're making profit by selling the admission tickets themselves, but then they can also um, charge for um, certain rides, charge extra for certain rides. And so that kind of sums up pricing strategy. It's, um, again, a pretty short chapter. And so um, if you do have questions, just feel free to let me know. But um, otherwise, have a good day.